All right, hey everybody, welcome to week two. Uh, we're gonna be reviewing the anatomy of receptors, nerve fibers, spinal cord tracts, and brainstem pathways. So for receptors and receptor-based therapy, uh, I think it's something important to keep in mind. Uh, again, my background is in functional neurology, so neurons need three things to survive. They need oxygen, they need glucose, and most importantly, on our end as providers, of manual therapy like chiropractic, they need stimulation. So some key concepts just to kind of keep in mind throughout this week. As I said before, the cell needs three things to survive, oxygen, glucose, and stimulation. Uh, the stimulation comes in the forms of chiropractic, exercise, physical therapy, modalities that you're using in your office, anything like that. And the stimulation that you're providing clinically leads to neuronal growth. The growth leads to plasticity. And a subluxation or a change in the movement of the spine can alter the frequency of firing the neurons and alter the ability to create plasticity. When you're doing adjustments, uh, just from a functional neurology perspective, activation of one side will usually stimulate the ipsilateral cerebellum, so same side, and the contralateral cortex. So I'm going to throw in just a couple of functional neurology tidbits here and there. And then proper stimulation can help reduce pain, right? You guys have seen in the office, different modalities can help reduce pain, whether it's the adjustment, TENS unit, uh, some sort of traction table, anything like that. So chiropractic is receptor-based therapy. And what I mean by that is we're going to be talking about some specific receptors uh, throughout the body during this lecture. And as providers of chiropractic and a manual therapy, we are affecting the receptors at the, at the receptor level. So, you know, touch of skin, um, using the TENS for stimulation, all those things, you're altering the frequency of firing of those receptors, which can have a central effect and change the way that the brain is perceiving that area, right? So hopefully make it better and make people feel better. So just something to keep in mind, uh, that's, that's my thoughts on that. We're receptor-based therapists and chiropractic is a therapy that is receptor-based in nature. So an introduction, the ongoing activity and output of the CNS, they're greatly influenced and sometimes more or less determined by incoming sensory information. We're sensory beings, uh, I tell all my patients that. So we, we, we need stimulation, but we need proper sensory stimulation in order to properly grow and develop and to maintain. So the basis of the incoming sensory information is an array of sensory receptors, cells that can detect various stimuli and produce receptor potentials in response, often with astonishing effectiveness. So this is where plasticity comes in. This is straight out of our book, but you know, the ability to change the receptor potential by providing receptor-based therapy and having astonishing effectiveness on the nervous system is something that you guys see in your clinics every day. So I wanted to throw this in here. Uh, the health of the neuron really does um, it plays a huge role in how the neurons can produce receptor potentials, the endurance of the neuron, and of course the ability to create plasticity. So neurons that fire together, wire together, is the Hebbian theory, and Donald Hebb basically said when an axon of cell A is near enough to excite B and repeatedly or persistently takes part in firing it, some growth process or metabolic change, if for those who do nutrition, uh, takes place in one or both cells such that A's efficiency uh, is that of B's uh, firing capacity is increased. So neurons that fire together, wire together. So sometimes in our office, what we'll do is we'll provide different types of stimulation simultaneously to drive specific pathways to create neurophysiological responses that create plasticity, that creates neuronal growth and helps change the perception of that area of the body to help decrease pain. So some types of receptors, I know you guys know a lot about this, but this week is review of anatomy. So chemoreceptors, they're responsible for smell, taste, and interoceptors. I want to touch on interoceptors because I think it's something we forget about doing manual-based therapy, but the interoceptive process is basically the brain's awareness of the internal organs where those body parts are in space. And I had a patient come in who had suffered a traumatic brain injury who over the course of a few months uh, was unable to eat any food whatsoever. And her interoception, so areas in the brain such as the uh, anterior cingulate gyrus and the insulate cortex, it was disrupted and the pathways are all disrupted. Her, her brain gut, gut brain pathways, they were all disrupted. So 
we increase the body's internal awareness uh, and increase the brain's awareness of the interoceptive process and we were able to get her to begin eating foods again three days a week and she's back to normal. So some cool things we can do with receptor-based therapy. Thermoreceptors for temperature, as you guys know, mechanoreceptors, so cutaneous uh, receptors for touch, auditory, vestibular and proprioceptors, I think that's the one we, we work with most, and then nociceptors for pain. Um, so uh, obviously, you know, we'll hit on proprioception and vestibular because those are those are the big ones for chiropractic. So some of the parts of receptors, although their morphologies vary widely, all receptors have three general parts. They have a, a receptor area, an area that's very rich in mitochondria, which is important, and then the synaptic area to pass the messages over to the CNS. So mitochondrial health when you're doing therapy is, is important, not just, you know, providing the therapy, but making sure that the health of the neuron is there so that the neuron can appreciate what you guys are doing in the clinic and so that it can increase the chances of creating synaptic plasticity and increasing the, uh, the brain's ability to do good things. So that's an important part of this. So receptive fields, this is, this is an interesting thing, and I think everyone can really relate to it when we talk about what's called two-point discrimination, if you've ever done that uh, for your board exams or in the clinic. But these are particular areas in the periphery, so like in your hand, for example, where application of an adequate stimulus causes the receptors to respond. The neurons in successive levels of sensory pathways, so second order neurons, thalamic and cortical neurons, also have receptor fields, although they may be considerably more elaborate than those of the receptors that we're going to talk about. But just, just to point out, the receptive field, when we're talking about it, it's just the density of, of neurons. And it's the brain's ability to be aware of where that body part is in space. So from a homuncular standpoint, it just may mean that that area has a big representation in the brain. So if you're doing something called two-point discrimination, what you may find is that you could put two little pins very, very close together on the fingertip of a patient, and they should be able to distinctly know that there are two pins there. If you make your way up to the forearm, they could be that close together, but the patient's brain may only be able to perceive one pinpoint. The further they get away, the, the, the larger the receptive field is. So, you know, if you have a stroke patient who had a, let's just say a right MCA stroke and had some sort of left hemiplegia, or they had some changes in the sensation on the left side of their body, if you check the receptive field in the forearm and you know it should be a specific millimeter apart, and you make your way to however many millimeters and you know that there's a very large distance, you'll know that there's some sort of deficit there. And what you can do to rehab it is actually just by testing the receptive field, so providing stimulation there. And you can actually change the way that the brain, the brain will perceive that area of the body in space. So pretty cool stuff. Something to know for the test is that the receptive field is much smaller and more dense uh, in the fingertips uh, than it is in the wrist because you're really not doing too much uh, touching and feeling with your, with your wrist more so with your fingertips. So transduction, uh, sensory receptors use ionotropic and metabotropic mechanisms to produce receptor potentials. Sensory receptors transduce some physical stimulation to an electrical signal. This is a receptor potential that the nervous system can understand. If we were going really deep into neurophysiology, it'd be pretty important to know this stuff, but just understanding that there's some sort of transductive process that is, you know, you're having a neurochemical consequence of that, you're also having a neuromechanical uh, consequence of that too, to create some sort of CNS change. Sensory receptors are similar to postsynaptic membranes as their adequate uh, stimuli are analogous to neurotransmitters. So all you really need to know for transduction is that there's it's a process where it's taking whatever is being provided as a stimulation and it's encoding it so that the brain can be aware of it. And this picture here has just got some different uh, receptors and then the pathways to the, the central nervous system. Don't really, really need to know anything on that image there. So this, this is a good image to know and to understand because when you're doing some peripheral testing on patients, it's, it's just good to know this stuff. So you've got encapsulated versus non-encapsulated. Um, your your non-encapsulated is gonna be mostly uh, your crude touch, pain touch. So temperature, itch, uh, pain. And if you go to the bottom of that table here, see if my clicker will work, you get your free nerve endings, uh, your Merkel endings, and your endings around hairs. So very rapid adapting for these hairs. That's like when you put a hat on and you feel it at first, then you forget it's there. 
uh, Merkel endings, they're slow, and then free nerve endings for pain, sometimes they can vary depending on the chronicity of the pain. Encapsulated, this is where you're really testing the dorsal columns. So you've got vibration by the Pacinian corpuscles, and then you've got some pressure and touch. Uh, what, I, what I may ask you on the test is, you know, what modality would affect what receptor? So an example for the quiz would be uh, the, you know, applying pressure would affect which receptor for the central nervous system. Something simple like that, because, you know, from a clinical standpoint, we don't really need to know too much about this. What we do need to know is that the diameter of a nerve fiber is correlated with its function. So a the bigger diameter, the faster the transmission is, and we know that to be the myelin sheath in the peripheral nervous system. Uh, the thicker it is, the more the more encapsulated it is, uh, the faster the messages are going to travel. So larger fibers conduct action potentials that are faster than do smaller fibers. The A alphas are the uh, largest and the most rapidly conducting, and then the slowest fibers are the C fibers. So A alpha is responsible for proprioception, which is what we do every day, testing proprioception. And the conduction speed is that of an airplane. Um, I'm not quite sure how accurate this image is. I just thought it was a good visual. I'm a visual learner, so uh, 80 to uh, 120 milliseconds. This isn't from your book, but the numbers did correlate, so I used it. And then down here, you got your C fibers, which is your pain pathways, and the uh, speed at which is significantly less at 0.5 to 2. You don't have to know the specifics here. Just know that A alpha is super fast, responsible for proprioception. And then C is your mechanical, thermal, and uh, chemical pain fibers that are non-myelinated, and they're going to be slow. So non-myelinated is slow. Here's just a good image of the, um, you know, the big guys. So these are your 1As, A-alphas. So right over here, very myelinated, responsible for proprioception. And then down here, these are your pain guys. These are the guys we don't like. They're unmyelinated, but they're slow from a transduction standpoint. And then just another chart for everyone to have, uh, you know, I, I won't test you too much on this chart, but just to know some of these things and to kind of keep in mind that A alpha is fast, C is slow. So one of my favorite things to do is research. And because these first couple of weeks are just anatomy, I don't have too many research articles pulled out in here, but I just like you guys, since this is master's program to have access to some articles. So any articles you ever watch, just let me know. I'm usually scouring PubMed for some good stuff to relate what we do clinically uh, to evidence-based practice. But just some good terms on here. It's a good table. And I liked, of course, the fact that they have plasticity down here, a dynamic modulation of signaling. But this is a, a pain paper, so we're not going to go too deep into it because we're just talking about anatomy. But uh, as we go on, we're going to be talking a lot about pain in the course. So receptors in muscles and joints can detect the muscle status and the limb position. So we've, we're going to talk about two. First, we're going to talk about muscle spindles, and these are direct quotes from your book. I'm trying to keep it as relevant to the book as possible. But the muscle spindles are they're long, thin stretch receptors that are scattered throughout virtually every striated muscle, every skeletal muscle in the body. And these muscle spindles sense muscle length and proprioception, so one's own perception of what's going on. So important stuff. Activation of these increased awareness of the brain's uh, the brain's ability to know where it is in space, so exercise is good for people, not just for looking good on the beach, but also to have a nice healthy fat brain. Uh, they are quite simple in principle, consisting of a, smooth, a few small muscle fibers with a capsule surrounding the middle third of the fibers. And here it is, just zoomed in right over here. You don't have to know all, all this fancy stuff, we're not going to get too crazy with that, but just to know a little bit about muscle spindles. Um, so expanding on that, these fibers are called intrafusal fibers that I just talked about. So down here at the bottom, when I ended it, surrounding the middle third of the fibers, they're talking about the intrafusal muscle fibers, which is Latin for spindle. So inside the spindle and in contrast to the ordinary extrafusal or outside the spindle. The ends of the intrafusal fibers are attached to the extras. So whenever the muscle is stretched, the intrafusal fibers are also stretched. The central region of each of the intrafusal fibers has few myofilaments and is non-contractile, but it does have one or more sensory endings applied to it. So when the muscle is stretched, the central part of the intrafusal fiber is stretched. Mechanically sensitive channels are distorted. The resulting receptor potential spreads to a nearby trigger zone. Trains of impulses ensues at each sensory ending. So activation leads to stimulation or vice versa. 
and you get these action potentials, which you know we're not going to go into or measure, but good to know. GTOs or Golgi tendon organs. These are spindle-shaped receptors found at the junctions between the muscles and the tendons. They're similar to the Ruffini endings, which we just talked about in the receptor area, and they're a basic organization consisting of interwoven collagen bundles surrounded by a thin capsule. And if you go to figure 9.16 in your book, you can see it, but I pulled out the picture there. So there are large sensory fibers that enter the capsule and branch into fine processes that are inserted among the collagen bundles. Tension on the capsule along its long axis squeezes these fine processes and the resulting distortion stimulates them. If tension is generated in a tendon by making its attached muscle contract, tendon organs are found to be much more sensitive and can actually respond to the contraction of just a few muscle fibers. Thus, Golgi tendon organs very specifically monitor tension generated by muscle contraction and come into play when fine adjustments, uh, no play on words there, and muscle tension need to be made. So like when handling a raw egg or actually receiving a chiropractic adjustment, you're getting activation of GTOs and muscle spindles, which is going to fire up into the ipsilateral side of the cerebellum, which we'll talk about the cerebellar pathways in a second, and it's going to make its way over to the contralateral cortex. So when you're doing therapies and you see some deficiencies, which at some point we'll go over a little bit of functional neuro uh, exams and rehab, but you can literally change the way that the brain perceives where the body is in space and change the functioning of the brain with just a chiropractic adjustment. So a little bit more on GTOs. So the mode of action of GTOs or Golgi tendon organs is quite different from muscle spindles. So if a muscle contracts isometrically, the tension is generated across its tendons and the tendon organs can signal this. However, the muscle spindles don't really do anything because the muscle length really hasn't changed. So if you're doing an isometric exercise, you're really more activating the GTO than you are the muscle spindle. Uh, just from what I know, clinically, GTOs will have more of an impact on changes in the central nervous system than muscle spindles do if you get good activation of GTOs. So that might be a question on the test, like uh, when you're doing an isometric exercise, are you activating more muscle spindle or GTOs? Yeah, sure, you're probably acting activating a little bit of both, but maybe more so GTOs and muscle spindles. So in contrast, a relaxed muscle can be stretched easily. The muscle spindles fire, tendon organs, however, they experience a little tension and remain silent. A muscle by virtue of these two types of receptors can have its length and tension monitored simultaneously. So fancy stuff there. Check it out in the book. So control of position and movement is simplified by combined muscle spindle and Golgi, Golgi tendon organ feedback. So there's just this constant uh, communication with movement, with chiropractic adjustments, with modalities and therapies that you're getting from muscle spindles and GTOs into the brain. So just a good paper. Uh, I can have the full article for you guys if you're interested. The right supermarginal supermarg gyrus is important for proprioception in healthy and in stroke affected participants uh, via a functional MRI study. So this is a good paper just talking about uh, which area of the brains were affected by different um, types of proprioceptive input. And they found in this paper that it was the right supermarginal gyrus. And what's interesting about left and right hemispheres is that the right hemisphere is the first hemisphere to develop. And it actually has a somatotopic map of both sides of the body, whereas the left side of the brain is more so just the right side of the body compared to the left. So the right side of the brain is really super duper important. And if you're interested in ever working with neurodevelopmental disorders or children with dyslexia or, or stroke rehab, you know, when you're doing brain-based therapy, you're going to find yourself mostly doing a lot of right brain, left body therapy because there's just so much input and so much output coming from the right side of the brain. So little side note there. And then the shaping motor cortex plasticity through proprioception. So I just like this paper. It talks about proprioceptive input, changes in proprioception, and how it has changes, uh, how it can create changes in plasticity and changes in hemispheric communication. So good stuff. This is what we all do on a daily basis. So important for us to know. All right, let's get into some of the pathways here. So the posterior column medial, medial lemniscal or lemniscus system conveys information about touch and limb position. So joint position sense, vibration, and light touch. So the term posterior column refers to the entire contents of the posterior funiculus. It's exclusive of its share of the proprio spinal tract. Just know that it's the posterior part of the spinal cord. 
you guys are probably doing a lot of this in your uh, anatomy class anyways. So the posterior columns consist mainly of ascending collaterals of large myelinated primary afferents carrying impulses from various kinds of mechanoreceptors, although substantial numbers of second-order neurons and fibers uh, are unmyelinated. They're also included in this, but it's mostly myelinated. This has traditionally been considered the major pathway by, by which information from low threshold cutaneous joint and muscle receptors reaches the cerebral cortex. So a zoomed in picture here, I think it's the same picture. Let me just double check. Yeah, okay. So just a couple of things to know about the DCML pathway, the dorsal column medial lumbiscal pathway. It's gonna carry vibration. It's gonna carry proprioception. So what you can do in your office, which we'll see in a second, is you can test these things. So what I usually do is I'll take a 128 Hertz tuning fork and I'll test bilateral upper extremities which if you look at the pathways here, the green one is going to roll into the nucleus cuneatus in the caudal medulla here. That's gonna be more of your upper extremities. So for the nucleus cuneatus on the outside of the, the brainstem area, and then your nucleus gracilis is gonna be more lower extremities, which is gonna be the more medial portion of the spinal cord and the uh, brainstem. So I test 128 hertz tuning fork, bilateral thumbs. I ask if they can feel it, if it feels the same on both sides. Then I'll make my way down to the legs. I see a lot of patients that have diabetic neuropathy and again, you know, stroke rehab, all that stuff. So being able to say, hey, does this feel like this in both thumbs? And then can you feel it in your toes? How well do you feel it compared to your thumbs? A lot of times what you'll see is you'll they'll be able to feel some vibration in their feet, but there'll be changes in the vibration. And you know that to be a change in the way of the messages being sent up to the nucleus gracilis and then over to the contralateral cortex. So just a couple of things to know about these. We don't have to know first, second, and third order neurons, but we should know that because of spinal cord injuries, <clears throat> the information is coming in to the ipsilateral side spinal cord. It's going to travel its way up to the caudal medulla and it decusates and this is why, I call it, why it's called the medial lumniscal pathway. It decusates in the caudal medulla at the medial lumniscus, and then it travels its way up to the contralateral parietal lobe. So that's what you're getting there through the VPL of the thalamus to the contralateral, contralateral cortex, parietal lobe. So ipsilateral, spinal cord, up into the caudal medulla, and then it's going to cross over the medial lumniscus, and then it's going to travel up to the VPL of the thalamus. Oops, and then it's going to make its way up to the contralateral cortex. Good to know? All right, got it. So damage to the posterior column medial lumniscal system can cause impairment of proprioception and discriminative tactile functions. So I don't want to read all this to you, but I guess I will. Um, as might be expected from types of afferents contained, the pathway carries information important for conscious appreciation of touch, pressure, and vibration, end of joint position, and movement. So this is important, you know, for walking, for people who are fall risks, got to test these pathways. Because input from the cutaneous receptors also reaches the cortex by other routes, damage to the posterior columns causes impairment but not abolition of tactile perception. So that's important to know. Complex discrimination tasks are more severely affected than is the simple detection of stimuli. Other functions, such as proprioception and kinesthesia, are classically considered to be totally lost after posterior column destruction. The result is a distinctive type of ataxia, which is in coordination of movement. The brain is unable to, to direct motor activity properly without good sensory feedback about the current position of the body parts. So the, this ataxia is particularly pronounced when the patient's eyes are closed because it pulls away their, their visual cues. <clears throat> so, because of the role of the posterior column, a common way of testing for fine touch is to ask the patient to recognize common objects placed with uh, a cloth using their touch. Vibration sense with the 128 turning fork can be put on bony prominences. I usually check distal limbs. Uh, if they're really bad, we'll go more proximal, but mostly just distal limbs like thumbs and big toes. Barognosis refers to the ability to determine approximate weight of an object. So you can ask them, hey, is this heavier than this? For graphesthesia, what you can do is have them hold out their hands or you can draw any body part on the arm, on the legs, on the feet, and then just draw out a letter or a number and see if they can tell what you're drawing out. Kinesthesia refers to one's own body, um, one's own sense of body motion. 
So it's commonly tested using a subject's ability to detect an externally imposed passive movement or the ability to reposition a joint to a predetermined position. So sometimes I'll have them move their arms and or I'll have them hold their arms out and I'll move their arms and say, hey, put your arm exactly back where it was before, see if they can do it. Proprioception, uh, you can test it with Rombergs. So you have them stand with their eyes open, eyes closed. From a functional perspective, if they don't fall over, it's not a positive Rombergs. But if you see sway, you see that there's some sort of alteration, sensory input, letting out motor output. So it could be a change in, in the function of the dorsal columns, the vestibular system, the cerebellum, could be a couple of different things. So the spinal thalamic tract conveys information about pain and temperature, as I'm sure you all know, but if the patients have a good brain, they can usually modulate pain. So one of the goals by doing neurotherapy is to help create a better brain so they can actually appreciate pain a little bit more and shut it down because pain is not all that bad. Pain lets us know when we're stepping on a sharp nail or walking over fire. So we need our brain to tell us when there's pain, but we also need to have the appropriate mechanisms to shut down the pain. Uh, so just again, this is a diagram saying good brain can shut down pain. I just liked it. Um, so the spinal thalamic tract, pain's a complex sensation. I'm sure you guys have had your fair share of tough cases or those patients that are just um, always in pain. Um, but it's complex and in that a noxious stimulus leads to not only the perception of where it occurred, but also things such as a rapid increase in the level of attention. You get the emotional reactions, autonomic responses, and greater likelihood that the event and its circumstances will be remembered. So they create a negative plastic response. We'll say that a uh, negative plastic emotional response to the pain, which can be good, but not if they perseverate on it. Corresponding to this complexity, multiple pathways convey nociceptive information rostrally from the spinal cord. One of them, the spinal thalamic tract, is analogous to the uh, PCML pathway that we just talked about. <clears throat> what's different about this pathway is, well, let's just say what's similar. If you can see down here, Leg is more medial in the posterior portion, as is arm, but over here, leg is on the outside, arm's on the inside. So you get this kind of twisting within the spinal cord. Not something you guys need to specifically know, but what you should know is that, and I'm sure you guys already do know this, when the sensation is brought into the spinal cord, it'll travel up two to three segments and then decussate over, and then travel up to the uh, contralateral cortex through the VPL, VPL of the thalamus. So instead of going up ipsilaterally and then crossing in the caudal medulla like the DCML pathway, you're going to get two, third, two to three segments up and then over. So it's a pretty quick jump over to the opposite side and then up to the opposite side cortex. <clears throat> and that'll make sense when you see some different cases. If you see spinal cord lesions, if you see spinal cord infarcts, when you're doing their testing, some of those will have patterns. So just something to remember, two main parts of the spinal thalamic tract. You got your lateral and your anterior spinal thalamic tract. This is just a nice little diagram. It kind of lays out different areas of the spinal cord, different areas of the body. Um, and it's got the motor efferent, but then also these sensory a afferent. So some of the stuff we already talked about here, DCML. We're gonna talk about these guys in a second. Then you've got your uh, spinal thalamic tracts. And then these I didn't hit on, but we're gonna, um, we're going to talk about those when we talk about pain modulation in the future. So damage to the spinal thalamic tract <clears throat> causes diminution of pain and temperature sensation. So exam, you got a screen for abnormalities that are common. It's commonly done using gentle pinpricks. If you use a pinwheel, uh, what I would recommend is you get disposable pinwheel heads because if you, you know, those things are super spiky. If you ever stab somebody with it, get blood on the pinwheel, it can create all, you know, some, some nastiness. So we have a little throwaway plastic pinwheels in our clinic, uh, pinpricks, cotton wool, uh, and they can contrast between sharp, soft. They can contrast between hot, cold, and just see if they can do it. <clears throat> if they have like an exaggerated response, that might be that there's negative plasticity in the pathway. They could have like some sort of condition like re reflex sympathetic dystrophy or CRPS. So just things to kind of keep in mind. This is a good paper. I won't read too much to you, but this is something we're going to be talking about again in the future. Uh, I love talking about pain modulation because 
pain can be modulated in so many different ways. And I'm sure you guys have some really good stories of how you helped shut down pain. But, you know, chronic pain is no bueno. Nobody likes it. Nobody, nobody's happy when they're in pain. So we have to figure out the best ways to non-invasively correct these pain pathways. And we can do it. So just another good little image. Um, you got your stimulus here. Then your nociceptor is your unmyelinated C fiber causing some issues down here. Uh, and then you get the peripheral nerve that travels up into the spinal cord. And then two to three segments later, it makes its way up as the lateral spinothymic tract. But this is, this is pretty cool. This shows, so <clears throat> your reticular formation is like a, a web-like distribution of neurons within your brainstem, kind of like spanning over your, your mesencephalon, your pons, and your medulla. I think you get a little bit in the mesencephalon but it increases the awareness of your brain and alertness. So, you know, your reticular activating system is the thing that kind of makes you aware of your surroundings. And if it's activated and there's pain, <coughs> excuse me, um, then you know not to go where that pain came from. Traveling all the way up through the thalamus and the VPL, you get a limbic response, so emotional response to it. Your hypothalamus sets off, creating a stress response and autonomic responses. And then your parietal lobe lets you locate uh, where that body part is in space so you can hopefully try to rehab it. So spinal information reaches the cerebellum both directly and indirectly. Um, basically, what I want you guys to know is that, like I said earlier in the lecture, Ipsilateral information is going to travel up ipsilateral cerebellum, and then it's going to make its way over to the contralateral cortex. <clears throat> so you have these three tracks. You have your posterior, anterior, and cuneocerebellar tracks. The origins I may ask about, um, you do have some crossings with the cerebellum, but they always cross back over. So there's, there's a little cross and then a cross back over. But I'll, I may just ask you guys a couple of questions about, you know, which which of these uh, tracks is carrying information about the lower extremity, the upper extremity, and they're all pretty much doing all the same things. But the cerebellum is amazing. There's, there's so many cool modalities we can do in the clinic using the cerebellum uh, as both afferent and efferent stuff. So good stuff. But these are cerebellar pathways. Um, and so kind of just like I said earlier, you've got... This pathway right here in the green is traveling over, crosses over, makes its way up, and then makes its way back over in the ponds um, to end in the cerebellar cortex on the ipsilateral side. But they all do end ipsilaterally. A lot of proprioception, a lot of the uh, adjustment will affect ipsilateral cerebellum, and a lot of your modalities in the clinic. So descending pathways influence the activity of lower motor neurons. Just to hit on this one real quick, your corticospinal tracts, as we know, produce motor output. 85% are going to um, cross over uh, in the pyramidal decusation area right here. But you've got uh, information coming in and then going out from the uh, precentral gyrus here. It's going to fire, fire over to the uh, contralateral uh, skeletal muscle. So just to know that. Um, these fibers are bigger, so sometimes we say like motion is lotion, movement can help shut down pain. If you have your osteoarthritis patients, uh, they feel better when they move. So for some patients, movement is key. You just have to make sure it's not a negative movement or they're not driving negative plasticity or driving their pain pathways with the movement. And then this is just the changes between upper motor neuron, upper, upper and lower motor neuron damages. So if you see lower motor neuron damage, what you're going to see is a lot of decreased stuff, right? Which makes sense. Uh, things just aren't going to work as good when the lower part of the nervous system isn't working good. So you'll see decreased strength, muscle tone, decreased reflexes, some atrophy, <clears throat> mostly could be severe depending on how long it's been there, and then fasciculation, so little tiny muscle movements. If you've got cortical damage, so upper motor neuron, You'll see decreased strength, but you'll see increased flexor tone and increased spastic reflexes. They may have some atrophy, uh, but at first they won't. They'll be tone, so they'll have tone, but then over time they may have atrophy. Then you'll see things like clonus, pathological reflexes like Babinski where you scrape the bottom of the toe. The big toe will come up as opposed to having a flexor response. So not don't have to know too much about that, but just good stuff to know. I believe that's it. Um, so thanks so much for 
hanging out, paying attention. Sorry if I talk too fast. I just don't want to keep you guys on the computer for too long because I know you guys all have amazing things to do in the clinic. So until next time.